Well, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 4, this is kind of part one of, of a two series, I guess. We have studied in great detail how we should love other Christians, and rightly so. But today we will begin on a topic of greater significance. That would be our love for God. As we mature in Christ, so should we love our Father, our Heavenly Father, more and more all the time. Our our love should grow in completion and perfectness, or perfection rather. Those are the two key words that we will focus on this morning, completion and perfection. We know that in love, our feelings or our emotions, they can ebb and flow. Some days we we feel great about things, and other days we don't feel so great about things. And so it is with love sometimes. After all, we are all more lovable at times than we are at others. But God desires that our love in Him and our, constant, and our confidence in Him would always remain steadfast in all circumstances. And that's going to be the focus of our lesson this morning as we look at the love we have for God and the importance that truth has on defining the genuineness of that love. Let's look at, at what... John writes for us in uh, his first epistle, chapter 4, starting in verse 17. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because He first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love the brother, or does not love their brother and sister, whom they have not seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And He has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And then, if we were to do this all in one lesson, it would continue over into chapter 5, where John says in the first uh, paragraph, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out His commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep His commands. And His commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So the big question is, how can you and I, as believers, know that the love for the Father that we have is being made complete and perfected? How can we know that? Evidences, and there are four of them, confidence, Honesty, joyful obedience, and victory. And the first one we're going to look at this morning is confidence. Again, he says in verse 17 through 19, this is how, we, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. So here's something I don't understand coming from a Christian. Some Christians are fearful of the judgment of God to come. 
oh, what's going to happen to me when I stand in front of God? (laughs) Have they forgotten that Jesus has already taken care of all of that business? We will not stand as followers of Christ, as sons of God. We will not stand in front of the judgment seat of God. We must remember what Jesus accomplished, what He finished. We are too quick to forget that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us and took the complete wrath of God. He bore all of it. We we have no work to do in that department. Okay, that's the Savior that you and I need. Because if it were just one sin, we would stand before the judgment seat of God. If it were just one sin, Jesus would still die for us. But we have multitudes of sin. And, and that's our confidence problem. Our confidence problem is the guilt. Our confidence problem is the past. Our confidence problem is our unholiness. Our lack of righteousness. But Jesus has taken care of all that too. We just need to realize that. That you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in your heart. You have been made righteous by God's choice. God chose you. Before God created the heavens and the earth, He chose you. Okay, yes, you had a part to play in that. God gave you free will to say yes or no. I'll follow you or I won't. But you have to remember God is omnipotent. He knows everything. He is not bound by time, the past, the present, the future. It makes no difference to God. He already knows all of it. But the evidence, the evidence that God took that sacrifice that Jesus made as a complete sacrifice is in the grave. Jesus rose from the grave. That evidence of His resurrection is proof and the source of our confidence. Period. Who here this morning does not believe that Jesus rose from the grave? then stop having any issues of confidence when it comes to God's love for you, Jesus' provision for you, and your (laughs) status in front of God. Don't let anyone tell you any differently. Sure, I, I will agree with you. You and I, we deserve judgment from God. And that was always going to be the case without Jesus. We deserve it. It was decided actually long ago in the Garden of Eden. But we understand that we are guilty before God because of our sin in our life. And that naturally causes a great deal of anxiety and guilt that we don't deal with very well. Once again, let me remind you that Jesus is taking care of your source of anxiety and guilt. It's nothing to be ashamed about any longer. What happened before Christ is taken care of. What's happened after Christ is taken care of because you have placed your faith in Him and He advocates for you at the right hand of God. You want to spend your whole life walking around with a cloud over your head? Well, I've got sin in my life, Alan. Yeah, so do I. Okay, let's work on that. Okay, the the Holy Spirit reveals that to us. The law of God was given to reveal sin in our lives. And we have it to deal with. And we will continue to have to deal with it. It's just the reality of living in this world. It's the reality of the fight against the accuser. 
It's the reality of the fact that we are still in the flesh. Okay, Every day, this body craves things that are unholy, that are unrighteous, and there's nothing we can do about the craving or the desires except put them to rest. Put them to rest. Recognize the moment and deal with it. Don't cave. God never once said that we wouldn't suffer in this life. That once we accepted Jesus, everything would be rosy. As a matter of fact, He painted a completely different picture for us in Scripture. And Jesus even says, take up your cross and follow me. Now, anyone who heard that in first century Palestine understood what Jesus was saying. Now, we kind of think about it and we're like, oh, okay. Yeah, that would be hard. The cross is heavy. And, you know, he had to drag it and that would have been hard. And you know, Seriously, the cross was awful. And we need to remember that. Jesus took three nails and a spear in the side so that you and I can be assured that we will be like Him in this world. That's what John said in, in chapter 4, that in this world we could be like Jesus. And let me get back to that. In this world we are like Jesus. Now, what exactly does that mean? This is what I think it means at the very minimal possibility. What I think we can be sure that it means. It means that you and I can be assured of our standing before God in this life. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about whether we're going to heaven or not. That, that, that has been decided. We are like Jesus in this world. We have been made perfect in this world by, by God. Okay, It means that we don't have to wait to get to heaven to understand our position before the Father. We know it now. Jesus knew His position with the Father when He walked the earth, and so do we. We know it now. We've already discussed, remember, we are, we are co-heirs with Christ. But we are co-heirs now. We are co-heirs to the kingdom of God now. We don't have to wait till we go to heaven. We are His precious possession in the here and now. Sometimes we don't feel like that though, do we? We don't, we'll get to that. But the most important thing to remember about this is not because of our love for God, but rather His love for us. Look at how verse 19 states it. We'll go back to it here. We love because He first loved us. Amazing. We love because He first loved us. I, I, just, I just want you to take a minute to repeat that to yourself in your mind. God loved us while we were still enemies with Him. Do you love the Taliban right now? Do you love ISIS right now? Okay, they're, they're our enemies. Such as we were to God. And He loved us. In Romans 5.10, Paul writes, For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, that act of propitiation, how much more shall we be saved through His life? You see, the death and the resurrection of Christ puts to rest all the false accusations that the enemy has against us. That's all in the past. Those accusations are false. 
Not because there's not any truth in them. Yeah, you and I know we've sinned. Satan's glad to remind us. And yes, we know. Okay? It's not because they're not true, but it's because they've already been judged. Our sins have already been judged. Jesus has paid the ransom price. It's dealt with. I know you think I'm beating this into your head, but I, I'm beating it into my head too. Okay? My mom says that I cannot keep a lie in my head for over a day. And she says that because she says that I'm the, the most guilty conscious person she's ever met. And I'll tell you why that is, because my mother was a queen of guilt trips. All moms are the queen of guilt trips. That's just what moms do. Okay. But the net result from this knowledge of, of the fact that our sins have already been judged, John is sharing with us here that that should be the disregard for fear. Fear should no, no longer be the part of the equation of our lives. Okay? Fear... <laughs> What do we have to fear if our sins have not only been forgiven, but judged, punished, and forgotten? Is there anything left that can be brought against us? If all that's been taken care of, why should we fear? After all, Christ died once for all. Period. That, that one perfect sacrifice took care of all our sins for all time for those that place their faith in Him. Because of what Jesus accomplished, we can live our lives without fear and without torment. Torment is part of that whole guilt and harassment thing that the devil likes to bring up against us. And don't let Satan bring up the past to condemn you, nor in the future, for that matter, because he's a liar, He's the father of lies, and speaking lies is his native language. No, we are not to have fear, but certainly we are not to continue living sinfully. Okay? All of this forgiveness, all this judgment that's already occurred, this, we, we are not 009 and have a license to sin. Okay, we, we, we must be repentant. The fear of judgment is taken away, but the healthy, reverential fear of God should always remain. We love Him because He first loved us. Our love in Him should be demonstrated through our actions and words. And if we continue to sin, we are not showing love for God. If the things we are saying are full of malice and spite, we are not showing or demonstrating love for God. Certainly we know we cannot love God through sin. We just can't. God cannot look upon sin. So the opposite of that would be living our lives by the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22-23 gives us a glorious list of character attributes that Paul describes. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you remember when you were a kid, they don't do this anymore, but on the back of your report card, if you flipped it over, there was a place for you to get a U or an S, an unsatisfactory or a satisfactory. And they were all behavioral issues. And on the self-control, I always got a U, <laughs> unsatisfactory. I remember that distinctly. But all these good attributes that, that come from the Spirit are from God. And they are 
a partial picture in human terms so we can understand of the essence of God. God is all these things. <laughs> is there anything in that list that makes you afraid? Especially knowing Jesus has made atonement or propitiation with the just attributes of God on our behalf. I don't think any one of us is afraid. Listen to how Paul describes God's perfect love for us in Romans chapter 8. If this doesn't give you confidence, knowing that you are increasing in your love for God, even this morning, I don't know what will. Verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Verse 37, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is perfect love. Nothing can take it away. Nothing can affect it. There are no conditions on it. He just loves you. Period. Closing up this topic, I want to read to you just what Warren Wearsby wrote in his book, about this perfect love. He says, The perfecting of God's love in our lives is usually a matter of several stages. When we are lost, or when we were lost, we lived in fear and knew nothing of God's love. After we trusted Christ, we found a perplexing mixture of both fear and love in our hearts. But as we grew in fellowship with the Father, gradually the fear vanished, and our hearts were controlled by His love alone. An immature Christian is tossed between fear and love. A mature Christian rests in God's love. A growing confidence in the presence of God is one of the first evidences that our love for God is maturing. But confidence never stands alone. It always leads to other moral results. Which brings us to our second topic, or attribute. Honesty. If you look at verses 20 and 21 from John 4, Paul says, Whoever claims to love God, yet, yet hates a brother and sister, or sister, is a liar. For whomever does not love their brother or sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And He has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother or sister. A great example of this, and you may take a while to agree with me, is a story found in Acts chapter 5 of a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira. And I think you're probably all familiar with the story, but let's look at it together because it... it <laughs> I think it really sums up the subtlety of how we try to put on, try to act, try to pretend to be something we are not. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you have received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not just lied to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell, fell down dead, or he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. 
Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what happened, and Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. And Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the Spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. So in the context of our scripture from John first 4, what strikes you in this text from Acts chapter 5? John tells us that we need to love our brother and sister for real. He commands us to do that. He says if we don't, then we don't have any love for God, or the love of God is not in us. In what way were Ananias and Sapphira showing disingenuous, disingenuousness among the brethren? What happened? They weren't completely honest. They were disingenuous. There was disingenuousness in their actions. But after all, I mean, they were giving of their own property to the church and helping provide means for the church. That sure seems like a great thing to me. Nothing that a person should drop dead for. Do you think Peter made a mistake here? No. Honesty or truth is closely tied to love. Actually, I would argue that love and truth cannot be separated. How many times do you and I tell a little white lie so we won't hurt the feelings of the person who has come to our attention or asked our opinion or when the truth if we really loved them the truth would probably help them probably. don't know for sure you don't know for sure but probably but what we do know is our little white lie will perpetuate the falsehood that they're trying to perpetuate. Okay, if, if, if someone comes up to you and has on 10 pounds of makeup and says, don't you think my makeup looks good tonight? And you say, oh, it looks wonderful, when inside you're going, it's hideous. Okay. Chances are they already know it's hideous. You're just perpetuating them in confidence to go out and show their hideousness. -ness. That's a poor example, but... <laughs> you see, whenever we take liberty with the truth, and notice I didn't say when we are lying, I'd hate to offend anybody. When we take liberty with the truth, we are simply not being real. Just like me admitting that was a poor illustration. See, we, we are like children pretending to be something or pretending to do something that isn't real. We're trying to disguise, mislead, or manipulate those or the situations around us for our favor. Usually, it's because of the flesh. Something that's going to make us feel good. Okay? Why do we do such things? Confidence is the issue. Let me repeat that. We do those things because confidence is the issue. We just talked at length about that. So, Let's do away with that one. Why do we do such things? 
take confidence out of the picture. Why, why do we why do we do such things? Well, to me, I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And when I threw out confidence as a reason to believe that we do such things, everything else had holes po poked in it. That, that at the very foundation of lying to disguise, to manipulate, to, to try to pull a ruse, it all had to do with ego. It all had to do with confidence in reality, confidence in the truth. Isn't it clear and evident to us now that our egos are problematic? The main reason we lie is that so someone will believe something about us that isn't quite real. That's the main reason. We are fragile and we lack confidence. We aren't confident in the lives and the abilities that God has blessed us with. And we want to be like others that have money or power or fame or peace, <laughs> civility. And that's too bad. We forget that we love because God first loved us. And I know I keep repeating that, but listen, we are at the core very unlovable. Our hearts are rotten. As far as being human beings, our hearts are rotten. I listen to Jordan Peterson a lot. He's a psychologist and he talks about World War II and he talks about the Nazis in Germany. And he says, you know, we think about that and, and, and we like to believe that we would be one of the good Germans. That we'd be like Schindler. When the reality is, those common men that became animals, German Nazi officers that did horrific things, they were just like you and I. And the reality is, that would be us. That's the reality. Okay. Now we tell ourselves, no, 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 no way. That's the reality. But God loves us anyway. Despite the reality. And that's the kind of love we are to show those around us. The unlovable, God loves them anyway. The unlovable in the church, we are to love them just like that. Is it easy to love each other? Heavens no. It's not easy to love each other. We have to make a choice to do that. Because again, we can be so unlovable. I'm the first to put my foot in my mouth and show my backside. And then all of you are second, right? We do it all the time. We do it all the time. John tells us that if we don't love our brother and sister, the love of God is not in us. If we don't love our brother and sister, the love of God is not in us. Are you going, who's my brother? Who's my sister? Let me make it easier on you. Who's your neighbor? That's your brother. That's your sister. See, this isn't just the brethren. It is the brethren, but it's not limited to the brethren. This is, this is all people. God does not discriminate. God does not show favoritism. That's how we're to love. I have no doubt that everyone here loves God or professes to love God. Okay, I have no doubt about that. Make no mistake. If you don't love the brethren for whatever reason, you're lying to us this morning, and you're just like Ananias and Sapphira were before he, Peter. You see, they were trying to mislead, claiming to be something they were not. But you say, Alan, <laughs> you don't know what they've done to me. You don't know how they've hurt me. I can't forgive them, let alone love them. Ask yourself this question. What if God had that kind of attitude about us? 
After all, it was our sin that had His begotten, unique, one and only Son executed on the cross, an instrument of torture and death. Now, wouldn't that make you mad? Wouldn't that make you have hard feelings at us because our son or our sin did that to Jesus, God's one and only son? And before that, he was beaten to near death by the Romans with the cat of nine tails. Before the nails. And we've talked about scourging and we've talked about the torture of the cross before. We we know the details of that and it was awful. So, please tell me, you're not going to sit here this morning and tell God, or tell me that God can forgive you that, but you can't forgive a brother or sister who has probably at the most just broken your heart. Let me remind you of something. That broken heart of yours has been transplanted by the heart of Christ. It's no longer you that live, but He that lives in you. Okay? Through Him, you can accomplish anything. Without Him, you can accomplish nothing. And our Scripture clearly says this morning that if you don't love your brother or sister who you have seen, you cannot love God who you have not seen. If you don't have the Father, you don't have the Son. And if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. God is love. Now, I know I laid it on pretty thick there, but that, I intended to do that. My mind, in closing, as I was thinking about all this, my mind was drawn to the idea that if you really want to grieve the Holy Spirit, keep on being a hater of a Christian brother or sister, especially. If you really want to grieve the Holy Spirit, hold on to that hatred. So for heaven's sake, let's give up on that hate. And let the Spirit of God that loves the unlovable teach us to forgive as we have been forgiven and love that person who was once unlovable to us but not unlovable anymore because of what Christ has done for us and what Christ has done in us. We love because He first loved us. Does that make a little more sense now? I hope so. I pray it does. There, this life is too short and there is no room for hate to occupy your spirit-filled hearts. Jesus has pushed all that out. Okay, there's no room for it. He will not allow it. However, if you do decide to resist Him, He will respond, I think, in two different ways. He will go silent and let, let Satan sift you. Or... He will continually bring it up to you and let Satan sift you. Either way, God will let you suffer in order to get your attention and teach you His ways and to get you to be obedient. But He will never, ever give up on you. And He will never stop loving you. And that's why He lets these things happen. To correct us. All of you, except Claire, including my wife, are a little older than me. You come from a generation where your dad took a switch and took you out back when you needed it, and he punished you. Okay? My dad was on the truck, so my mom did it. And it usually was a wooden spoon. Okay, that was after the guilt trip. And she got the honesty out of me, then I, then I had to pay the price. Okay? We come from a generation where discipline was evident, is what I'm trying to say. And it was practiced. I'm here to tell you this morning that it's rare. And why is that? 
Because in Putnam County alone, where we live, where we love, where we fellowship, 70% of the children in Putnam County are living in non-traditional homes. 70%. I kind of got off a little there. I just want to leave you this thought. Don't let a simple little thing like disingenuousness telling little white lies get between you and God. Okay, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Okay? We have it in us to be truthful. We do. We have the source of truth in us. So let's choose to be truthful. Truth and love go together after all, right? They can't be separated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to continue to study from your word. And Father, I, I just ask that if I took liberty, you would forgive me. And Father, these are serious, serious things you're talking about here through John our love for you, our love for each other, it, it doesn't get any more serious than that. So, Father, I just felt like that I really need to play on the hearts of anyone who would listen this morning to help us draw to a closer understanding of the love that you have for us and how pure and perfect it is and how we are thankful that it isn't conditional and how we are thankful that it's possible because Jesus was willing to sacrifice himself out of love for us. Father, thank you for all these saints that are here this morning. Thank you for the love that they have for each other. Thank you for the love they have for me. Thank you for the love that they have for you. Father, may it be our focus when we leave this place this morning that our love for one another would be evident at the very least so that people would know we are Jesus' disciples. I think all of us want to be known what do we want to be known for, is the question. He told us in Scripture just recently that <laughs> through us, your love is made complete. By how we love one another, your love is made complete. And we have to understand, Father, that that's how the world will see a glimpse of your love is through us. People just don't stand in front of the Red Sea and part it anymore, Lord. I'm not saying that miracles don't occur. I'm just saying that time has passed. And now it's the little things that matter, the things that are unnoticed that matter. The opportunities that you give us just to meet the very substance needs of our neighbor that's the kind of love that you want us to show and and not even sacrificially father you you ask us to give out of our abundance so you've made it easy for us lord help us understand the reality of our community and our county help us to understand that while it's great to uh, give to the church and take care of financial needs of the church and the community as we as we generously offer uh, our testimony through 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 giving to others and needs. But but Father, our time is what people need. Our time, our testimony, is what people need. Father, go with us now as we observe this time of communion. Allow our hearts and our minds to clear out all the rubbish of the week 
and to focus upon Calvary where your precious Son gave up his life for us and died. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.